All right, so good afternoon, good evening, good morning, no matter where it is you're tuning in from. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our third Careers in Tech Roundtable. Whenever we do the, these things, I always say that I, I'm so shocked that I, I got people to say yes, and the crowd just keep and our, our panel just keeps growing and growing and growing. And today we have four amazing women who are going to be sharing their perspectives uh, as both recruiters and folks who work in tech. Uh, so this is going to be a really uh, great conversation, and uh, they include Alexis Skinner, the Associate Director for Talent Acquisition at Axios. We have Chandana uh, Sadananda, uh, Technical Recruiting Manager of Latch. We have Hillary Gardner, Director of People U.S. and Global Recruiting at SoundCloud, and Sarah Braver, VP of People at Graphica. So, so happy to have all of you here, ladies. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, before we get there, though, for those of you who are just tuning in and who don't know who we are, let's fill you in. Line Run is an experiential career in industry education platform for tomorrow's workforce. We empower our community of leaders to connect, innovate, and grow through media events and programs such as today's session. We invite you to check out our website, www.linerun.co, to learn more about our podcasts, classes, and career accelerator programs. So, Line Run. And yes, we do a lot of cool stuff every month. So, come, come check us out. Uh, with that, we'd love to uh, begin our conversation today, not go straight into recruiting questions, but I want to learn more about each of our panelists and their personal journey into technology. And today, I'd uh, love to start with Alexis. Alexis would love to hear your story. Yes, happy to share it. Hi, I'm Alexis Skinner. Um, I work at Axios, which is a digital news and media company, and we're also getting to the tech space. As you can imagine, since we report on business, tech, and politics, it's going to be a really crazy year for us. Um, that's really exciting. Um, so I'm associate director over there. Um, and I also help lead our Actions of Color Employee Resource Group, which is for people of color, um, which is really exciting. Um, so I kind of got to Axios by chance. I started in sales and business development for a healthcare company and did not like it. <laughs> I did that for a few years. Um, and then I was thinking about like, what do I actually wanna do with my life? Um, Cause I didn't really know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in my next step. And so um, outside of my regular nine to five job of like, chasing down leads and working with my marketer. I would help with onboarding. I would help with learning development. Uh, I would help with training, whether it was like DNI or onboarding new interns. And I found that I just loved working with people and I loved helping people. It never occurred to me to really find a job in recruiting, um, but someone from my company went to Axios and they considered me, they said, hey, we're hiring for a new um, uh, recruiter. And we do actually value a background in sales uh, because it's so similar to uh, recruiting and so like because I had worked with pipeline I worked with leads I had you know been selling something to like an audience it is very applicable to recruiting actually and everything that I had done in my life previously married perfectly to the role at Axios and so I was just like really fortunate to snag this opportunity and they invested in me um, and it just was like a really perfect fit and I think that experience really ties in nicely and my advice is like if you know, you're kind of pigeonholed into doing one job. You can always find things to do in your current opportunity that help in your next step, which is what I kind of did. Uh, and so like being at Axios kind of exposed me to all of that opportunity. It's been really exciting. And I think I hit everything, but I'm probably missing something, but I think that's everything uh, that kind of led me to Axios. Thank you so much. And Chandana, yeah. we'll love to have you next. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Chandana and huge thanks to Brian and Lime Run for hosting this and having me speak today. I'm super excited to be here. I am with a Series B startup called Latch. Our headquarters is in uh, New York City and we have a small office in San Francisco as well. And we essentially create these really robust uh, hardware to software access systems that we sell B2B only. So think of like the large high rises and low rises and residential buildings you'll see pop up all over the cities. Those are the only people that we sell to really. Um, it has been you know crazy growth since I started. I started about two years ago. We were 
um, just a little under maybe about 80 people and now we're, we're over 200. Um, and contrary to what you might think, you know, nothing has slowed down uh, post COVID. We're still, we're still full on steam and um, lots of craziness and excitement going on all the time. Um, as the technical recruiting manager there, I essentially managed the entire function of anything that has to do with tech hiring. Um, so that started with like really building all of the processes from scratch and how we conduct hiring and interviewing. Um, and let's see here, our, our Eng org is about 80 people right now and that encompasses hardware, software and firmware. So it's been really exciting to see, you know, all of the different types of engineering hiring that we do and all three of them are so entirely different, um, all just as important as the other. I started my career um, right out of school at Google for about two years in Silicon Valley. And then I moved to Uber for about three years and then came to Latch. So I saw, you know, giant tech and then mid-size that kind of grew into giant tech and, and now a Series B startup. So really interesting to just get an entirely different perspective and, and excited to share with you all today. Wonderful. And being able to experience all of the, the wide gamut of different tech companies, I, I think is really wonderful and a great perspective to have. So thank you. Hillary, we'll also love to ha have you share a little bit more about uh, your journey into tech. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so similar to Alexis, I didn't know what I wanted to do and got into sales and just kind of fell into um, prospecting and figuring out how to close deals and just really understand sort of like what that, what that basically looked like. Uh, but I wasn't in love with it. So I made the jump to recruiting through a um, small startup agency that focused on mobile and social gaming kind of at the beginning of Farmville. I don't know if anyone even remembers what Farmville is, but that was when I started. We were um, recruiting engineers to, to go work for mobile gaming. And I went in-house with a company. Um, it was actually a Japanese gaming company in their U.S. headquarter and grew that team pretty substantially. We actually doubled the company in size, which was so crazy. Um, and sort of the beginning of my hyper growth experience. Um, shortly after that, I fell in love with New York City. So I made the move out to New York. I live in Manhattan now, which is so fun. Um, and I've sort of made my way through New York tech from ad tech with a small company called Adaply and now to SoundCloud, which is the intersection of music and technology, which is so fun. Um, not necessarily a startup anymore, but still sort of getting that hustle going. Like, you know, some of our competitors are Spotify and YouTube and they are massive while we are about 400 people. So I now lead um, global recruiting. I have a team of about six individuals reporting into me. We're gonna push some pretty hyper growth, um, which will be exciting as well as uh, HR for the US, which is total left turn with my career from recruiting everyone into now um, being sort of the, the HR head as well, but huge growth for me, huge exciting times, um, just kind of continuing to learn and grow and see what else we can develop. Um, it's fun working at SoundCloud because it is an incredible platform that allows creators and listeners to connect. In a lot of ways, that's what recruiting is doing as well, is connecting you to your next big career. Um, you're spending more time with your coworkers and at your job than you are with your family. So it's a really, really significant piece of, of the day. Um, to be able to have that impact on people is cool and, and to be able to do it at a company that is you know, allowing such sort of creativity and connection is is really cool. So I, uh, I'm very privileged and very happy with where I am. Wonderful to hear. And also anytime you're able to have a positive impact, it, it just makes it that much better. Sarah, last but not least, love to hear your story. Sure. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Brian, so much. I always feel very lucky to get to, to join events like this. So thank you so much for, in, for including me. Uh, my name is Sarah Braver, and my career has been uh, really interesting, I think, <laughs> as a participant in it, um, with the exception of a little interesting false start in right after college where I was doing um, photography and design type of stuff with the newspaper. Everything since then has been deeply focused on building capability in people and building capability in organizations in order to get stuff done. So that has been at um, 
in the nonprofit world around education, social justice. It's been in as a consultant partnering with lots of different types of mission driven organizations, figuring out how to do people work, how to actually build a people organization from the ground up. How do you make your first hires? That sort of thing. Um, I spent a couple of formative years in an organization called Duke Corporate Education, uh, which created the concept of custom executive education. So building education programs for companies based on their own strategy. So instead of sending your execs over to, to Harvard or to Duke, instead uh, we would come in and build these really transformative education programs and our, our partners, our clients, we're heads of HR, chief learning officers, heads of people, that sort of thing at Fortune 50 companies. And so I had the privilege of sitting in the classroom. I got to design and run these massive global education programs alongside some incredible folks uh, as a program manager. And the education that I got was incredible. So I was both getting, um, felt like a free MBA, but also um, working with the best talent in the world at running talent. I was really inspired by that and I did a lot of stuff between then and now, but that's that's still the foundation of who I am as a professional is um, how do you use education? How do you use capability building as a way to grow as a company and as a way uh, to build talent and get people to achieve the best things that they can achieve? Um, my core identity as a professional is as a, a diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging professional, um, because I don't think you can get anything done at a company if people can't uh, be themselves and can't relax. Uh, so my primary focus as a as a people professional is reducing hostility at work, making it so that people can succeed, um, and working really really hard in the talent acquisition process to make sure that what you're assessing is actually the thing that they're going to be doing in the job, and that we're not accidentally assessing all the other things instead. Um, so the way I got to tech was when I left Duke Corporate Education, I was really inspired to go do hands-on learning and education, um, but instead of with big corporations to do it um, in the public school system in the United States. So I joined an organization called Citizen Schools and I did their teaching fellowship because I knew from my work at Duke CE that if you want to do an important job, you have to do the hardest job first. And the hardest job in that world was teacher. Uh, so I did teaching uh, and it was really hard. <laughs> um, but then I, I grew up in that organization through uh, be becoming first a recruiter and then building capability within the own rec the recruitment force and then uh, designing competency models is where I ended up, which is which is the, the heart and soul of what I do is making sure that it's clear what you need to be able to do in order to succeed. Um, and so then I took a bunch of interesting, fun sideways steps into new spaces, including um, spending time in a nonprofit organization called All Star Code, uh, which was my first step into tech, which is an organization that runs, um, you know, coding and entrepreneurship boot camps for uh, uh, young men of color in New York City and a few other places as well. And so through building the people capability of that organization, I got introduced to tech. And so that is um, after that, my next big gig as a consultant was at Graphica, and Graphica is um, a Series A startup. It sounds weird to say that because we feel very grown up sometimes, um, but we're a Series A startup that does, um, we have a beautiful platform that builds sophisticated maps of networked data, um, and usually that's social data. Um, so we build um, net, uh, we build maps of essentially the neighborhoods online, uh, the cyber social terrain. And the coolest thing that that does is mis and disinformation detection. Uh, so we're in the news all the time. If you looked up what Graphica is, we're often uh, participating in uh, electoral defense, making sure we can have safe and free elections here in the United States, but also around the world. We're doing a lot of work in Myanmar right now alongside our work in the US. Um, but there's also lots of cool like marketing and, and tech implications for, for that mapping as well. Uh, so I'm lucky to head up all people stuff, not just talent acquisition, but organizational development, performance, employee engagement, DEI, everything. Uh, and we've tripled in size since I joined. Uh, today is my two year Graphica anniversary since I joined exactly two years ago. Congratulations. And it's just, it's, it's really heartening to, to hear your journey and everyone else's on the panel. The fact that you've been able to, all of you have been able to make inroads in completely different areas, but still find your way into tech and into the roles that you have now and be informed because of those perspectives. So thank you so much for that. Uh, love to dive right in uh, now that we know a little bit more about each of you and your background uh, in, into our panel today. And Hillary, we'd love to start with you. Pandemic 2020, obviously a lot of disruption, a lot of change, a lot of adaptation to 
what they call the new normal. How has your company strategy and hiring strategy uh, adapted a change in response to these challenges? And what do you see on the horizon based on what's happened now? What do you see moving forward in the next year or so? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we actually went through a hiring freeze over the summer because of COVID. Uh, we were very lucky in the sense that our business itself sort of survived and became a bit more COVID proof because listeners were still engaging with music, creators were still making you know, music, everybody's at home. It's an opportunity to, to really sort of interact. Um, but from a hiring perspective, we did slow down and we paused or froze all net new hires. Uh, we did see a little uptick in attrition, which was a bummer, but we were able to continue to bring on board uh, new individuals. So we actually closed about 60 people from March up until now, which is crazy. Um, and in terms of what's on the horizon, it's really about um, some pretty substantial growth. We were also really lucky in the fact that we closed a round of funding in February, maybe earlier than that. So it was like perfect timing. Cash is in the bank. We're good. Now we can start really like flexing that and utilizing it. Um, so we have some pretty aggressive growth plans for the next nine months, uh, which is why I have such a big team after being so small for so long. Um, but the other thing that we're sort of challenged with is how do you bring culture through to that? You know, we were such an in-person office environment and the culture really was organic. It was an opportunity to really engage and learn from one another. So how do you do that when you're remote? Um, so that's kind of the question that we have to answer at the moment. And from a recruiting and onboarding perspective, it's something that I'm thinking about. Um, we have little things like Donut, which is a, an app via Slack that puts you together with someone. Yeah, so you've heard of it. Um, we do things uh, at the end of the week called Fika, which is a, a Swedish tradition of coming together. And it's an opportunity to just sit down, have coffee with one another and talk about a highlight from the week, what you're doing for your weekend plans. Um, we've had Zoom parties, we do socially distant picnics. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to do, um, but it is definitely something that from a hiring perspective is uh, a question mark as we move through COVID, you know, further into next year and kind of beyond that, because we could end up having over a hundred new starters that are all remote uh, and have never been in the office. And what does that mean? Um, how do you sort of, you know, get them to a point of success? So lots of things to think about, but yeah. And uh, I could answer as well. Um, thank you, Hillary. The, this is such an interesting time for us, a time of growth. We are also incredibly lucky that um, I wouldn't necessarily say COVID proof or not COVID proof, but turns out during a global pandemic, boy, do people want to use mis and disinformation. Um, and so it has put us um, or kept us at the bleeding edge of the science and technology that's used to detect this type of thing. Um, we are also very lucky or smart, I guess you might say strategic in that we had put in for quite a bit of R&D opportunities um, when we made the decision last this, this past December uh, not to do a B round. And so when we realized we could grow organically, um, we said, well, one of the ways that we can do that is by funding large R&D because we have a whole lab. We have an entire research um, institution within the organization. And so by doing that, no matter but um, institutions like that, are COVID proof. Budgets are budgets. The money has to get spent. So we are very lucky. Um, it slowed things down a little bit in terms of how and when some of that those funds came in. Uh, but the projects themselves are happening and we got to do staffing up against these really, really cool cutting edge R&D projects, which gave us access to some of the best talent in the world that we've been lucky um, to sort of capture during this time. Um, and the way that we've adjusted our process um, fe feels seamless. It doesn't feel that different, but it's, this is a week of, of a lot of what we're jokingly calling non-site interviews, like not on-site interviews. Um, and I can really feel the difference when they're happening all day back to back, um, which is it, it felt so normal to make the adjustment because every adjustment we had made in our culture just gets then reflected in the interview process. 
Um, it's a highly collaborative interview design process. Um, one of my deep philosophies that I bring wherever I go when I'm building hiring capabilities is that hiring is everyone's job. Um, when, when somebody gets brought into the organization on their first day, they should feel like they already work there because every they've touched almost everyone at some point in the process. And so it was just a matter of uh, changing the now we're in a, in a room all day or now we're at the office all day to how do we coordinate this on Zoom? How do we how do we keep candidates feeling engaged and like they're a real person? Um, how do we, you know, make them feel included? And, you know, I practice radical inclusion in everything that I do at work. And I wanted that to be, to feel real. Like, I don't want people to feel like they're performing. I want them to feel like they belong. Um, and I think we're pulling it off. Like I've, I've had some really good feedback about the process itself and how it's going, but also is highly iterative. Um, unlike in-person interviewing, which has standards that everyone kind of knows how it goes. This is like, we try it, we get feedback, we update it, sometimes in the middle of the day. Um, okay, well, that didn't work. That Zoom transition was weird. We should we should keep the thing open and now a new person's gonna join instead of closing and reopening, like that kind of thing. Uh, so being flexible and iterative in the process has been really important. Um, and we made a big, big decision as an organization um, for our tech group in particular, our engineers um, who had been 100% co-located in New York, um, we said, okay, we're not ready to just say, you can be anywhere in the world. Um, but what we said is that as long as you're in the continental US and you're willing to work on East Coast time and our engineers, it's a pretty liberal uh, East Coast time. They start at like maybe 10, uh, their standup is at 1030. Um, so as long as you're willing to sort of norm with this, with this coast, um, then, then we'll do it. And when our first hire, and that was someone in Portland, Oregon, immediately we had access to so many more applications, so much, so much more talent. And we were really excited to include more people in that process. Um, because we, we've all talked about this, about how expensive some of the markets are where tech is. And now suddenly people who live in Portland or in Denver and some of these other major metro areas can consider work anywhere. Um, so, and then onboarding has also been a highly iterative, highly collaborative, very inclusive process um, where if somebody's starting remotely, um, it's a whole new ball game. And we, I, I could talk and I shouldn't keep talking because other people want to talk, um, but I could talk the rest of the night about how hard we work at socializing um, the social lunches for, for new, for onboarding people and for candidates. We have a lunch or a tea uh, during every non-site interview um, where people from all over the company join in and just eat their own lunch wherever they are. And it's just a fun time. Um, and onboarding stuff, we have the same thing. We also use donut, we call our tea talks. Um, I like Fika as a, as a, as a good alternative. Um, but it's all about, you have to do social engineering. It will not happen organically. And so we've had to engineer it to make it work. And I've been really pleased so far. I love the term radical inclusion and can't wait to talk more about that with you, Sarah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, at Axios, we were also super fortunate to not just have like smart leadership that made really strategic moves, but also to have a product that people were still engaging with. Like since we're a media company, people were still, you know, getting our newsletters, going to our website. Um, so that was really good. We paused hiring slightly and slowed it down in the pandemic. Um, and then right when June hit, it like skyrocketed. So we went from hiring three roles to hiring 15. Uh, so it's been really, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy as a recruiter. I'm sure you all can be like, wow. Um, but we were still actually taking phone screens and doing Zooms when hiring was slowed so that we weren't going to start from a cold or blank pipeline when things did reopen. So what we were doing is we would post positions and say like, this isn't active, but we are gathering resumes. We're taking conversations with people. So they knew that like we weren't actively hiring. Um, so they could opt in or, or not to take the conversation, but that way we could talk with product managers and engineers and um, people that were fresh out of boot camps that were interested in Axios, but that understood like we don't have this role open, but let's form the connection now so that like you knew my face, you knew my name, and you could reach out and we could have that so we weren't start so that we weren't starting completely fresh. Um, and that was also a great time to like you know clean up our ATS and get organized and think through you know, should we make a prep document to make sure candidates felt prepared about like the culture and what to expect. So like we did all the things we normally don't have time to do um, during that time because we had nothing but time largely. Um, so it was really great. And then because we weren't having people coming in person, we would just get more time over Zoom. So like I would usually do a, a phone call, uh, but we would turn it to Zoom so that they could again get like put a name to a face since they weren't coming in to interview on site. Uh, and then we would also, before they met with the team, we would hop on Zoom before to say like, you know, is your 
Zoom working okay? Do you have any questions before you hop on? Do you have like the names of people you're meeting with? Do you feel prepared to make sure that like they felt good about going into those conversations? So again, like we already had a really big human element for these interviews, but we understood that people were dealing with layoffs and different situations. So like, let's make it even more human and understanding. And again, like to Sarah's point, iterate and, and change where needed. Uh, in terms of like for current employees, we would have, I mean, thank goodness for Slack because we would have again, donut time. We have something called lunch bunch. We would just meet and talk for lunch. We had comedy shows, pet Zooms. We, you know, had additional pandemic related benefits like work from home or mental or not work from home because we're all working from home, um, but rather mental health days and work from home stipends to make sure people felt like they were engaged and could, you know, sign off when they need to sign off um, and also have the resources available to them if they needed like a standing desk or like slippers or a heated blanket. So we tried to do all of those things to make it more bearable um, and adjust our process. And it has been pretty, pretty great thus far. Really happy to hear from all of you about how you've been able to engage with not just your, the teams that you have working at your companies currently, but also folks who may be coming in and who are interviewing and also making them feel welcome too. That, that, that's very, very important. And I know that's something that a lot of job seekers uh, really aren't really able to grasp until they actually they get involved with it. So I think it's really good to, to hear that early on and love donut. I think that's a universal thing. We all love donut. Um, Shandana, we'll love to go to you next. Uh, we're talking about adaptation and engagement and the whole process of bringing people uh, to a team. And from your experience working in recruiting, what are the top three things you look for in an application or resume in evaluating an entry level uh, candidate, uh, particularly if they're, in, they're going for a technical role? What do you look for? So with a technical role um, applicant, in an entry role position, I think there are kind of two routes that we take. Um, for myself personally, if I'm evaluating someone that has come from a really traditional background, um, they graduated from you know school that maybe traditionally is really known for having a great CS program, I think that's, that's probably the first thing that I look for, what school they went to and whether they have a degree in computer science. Um, you know, the second thing, and the reason why for that is because a lot of fundamentals are developed. Um, a lot of fundamentals are developed within coding and, you know, how backend systems work. And I think that is really invaluable to how, um, you know, an entry level engineer can operate on day one because they bring so many CS fundamentals with them to the table. Another route is um, internship work. So, um, you know, while this person might be junior and maybe they don't have exposure to big architecture systems and they're not developing, you know, the architecture at, at a given company, they have exposure to it. So whether they have an internship at a company that operates off of a large scale distributed system, uh, being exposed to the code base and to the backend systems is another huge thing. Now for people who maybe don't come from a very traditional background and, you know, they've worked maybe um, in sales, like a couple of the ladies here or, you know, something else. And then they decide that they're actually really passionate about technology and they want to go to a boot camp. The project work is going to be really key there. You know, whether they've been, um, you know, utilizing open source on their own and really been exposing themselves to, to different types of code and technology on their own through project work is probably the three different buckets or the three different boxes that I could check for, for some different backgrounds going into an entry level role in tech. Sorry, my mute and unmute button seems to have disappeared on my screen. So I'm using my space bar, sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's really helpful to hear. I wanted to answer because we're hiring our first proper entry level technical position ever right now. So I'm learning this live. Um, and I just went through a hour long debrief with folks about um, what we learned from the comparison between entry level folks resumes and what we actually learned during the interview process. So I have some fresh, fresh feedback um, to give all of you in your first in your first uh, entry level type position. And the biggest piece that came out of it was interviewers want to understand, companies want to understand whether or not you've worked in a production environment. Um, and it's very important that you be clear on your resume whether or not that's true. Um, and that it can be very tempting to um, uh, 
I don't, I don't mean this in a judgmental way at all. It can be tempting to pad your resume to make it seem that you've done more than you have. That is the culture of resumes. I understand I, this is literally a zero judgment environment, um, but it is very difficult for a small, really intense team doing a lot of important work to go through an entire interview day because they believe that you have production level experience and you don't. Um, and so being really clear about what you have done and you have not is so important. Um, and having the humility in the process, either in the application, um, to be clear to be clear about that. Um, the, um, the mention of projects from boot camps, et cetera, is important. Um, but what I want to know from my perspective as a person who has yay and nay rights in this, um, in this even though I'm not the, the technical manager or the technical recruiter, um, is what kind of experience you have working with other people um, especially technically. I want to know, um, if you said you built a thing, did you build the thing? <laughs> or did you work with a group of people who built the thing? Did you have the idea? Um, and I, I want to know how you work together. I want to know how you dealt with situations and feedback, et cetera. That's not going to come up during the technical interviews. Um, but if you can be clear about that in the early in, in the process, so by your resume or your application, that's really valuable for both the, the um, engineers who are going to interview you and someone like me who has final sign off on your hire. Um, someone asks, what is production level experience? Um, so the way it came up in this uh, interview process for right now is we're hiring a junior research engineer and a research engineer answers um, scientific or research questions with code. So they're software engineers who are doing research. And this is also true for data engineers. This is also true for most software engineers is that if you're at a boot camp, or if you're in school and you're working on a project, um, yes, maybe there's a deadline, but that deadline is six weeks from now. Um, or you're building a, a model to ingest data because you're you're trying to be a data engineer or you're in your first role um, in some sort of uh, data science or data engineering. Um, production level experience means um, you were experiencing things real time. They're coming at you. Uh, you have to put it into prod, meaning it has to be tested up against other code. Is it going to work? Um, you have to deal with all the factors, all the stakeholders, all the clients, all of the other uh, types of things in reality that are very hard to replicate in a bootcamp experience um, or in an academic experience. It doesn't invalidate the experience that you get at the bootcamp or in, ac in academia. Those things are also important, but it is a big difference that you just need to experience a production level environment, um, that could be you got to work on a real thing in your internship at a tech company, right? That isn't a quote real job, but that's a production level environment where you're dealing with real factors and real pressures and real timelines and not the sort of um, simulated experience we get in academia or in boot camps. Um, so those were only two things, not three, uh, but they're so live and fresh, I wanted to share them. Definitely, and Alexis would also love to hear from you uh, on what you think here in terms of um, how you're approaching choosing folks for technical roles. Yeah, no, I think that those answers were beautifully answered, honestly. Um, the only thing I wanna add is when looking at resumes, like recruiters are often dealing with a lot of volume. And so like a really nice, clear, succinct resume that like clearly outlines your experience, the tools, languages, frameworks that you're most familiar with. And again, like, don't budge your resume, put on there like what you've actually touched, what you've actually worked in, because it'll come out if you haven't. Um, so yeah, just like outline that really briefly one page, because whether it's an ATS or a person, it's read that they're going to be leafing through things. And again, like it's not just the technical skills, it's the soft skills, which are huge. Like more people get, um, don't get through the process if their collaboration, like can they take and implement feedback well? Can they you know, if they're doing pair programming, can they give feedback in a respectful and kind way? Like those types of things are also really important that will come out in the interview process, which we also look for because nobody wants to work with a super talented um, a-hole for lack of a better word, because it's important, you know, to be a good colleague. Um, and again, like every company is going to have different standards for, you know, their junior, their mid, their senior roles. So I think as long as you are, putting forward like what you've truthfully done on a project, whether it was like a personal one or a team one and not budging that as well. I think that's really important. But again, like strong resume, showing the impact that you actually made. I think again, shipping apps to production is really important versus just like maintaining something that has been there. Um, but again, I think like studying what the company is looking for because there are different intricacies outside of what's on the JD. 
you know, come out. Um, but yeah, I think that those things will put you ahead for sure. Being able to articulate all of those things is also really crucial. And I know that's something that we've been teaching our students as well is um, how do you translate your experiences and tell a story that ultimately can be applied to the position you're going into and being able to bridge that is really, really crucial. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Hillary, I'd love to go back to you. And, you know, we're talking about first jobs, we're talking about internships, uh, what recruiters look for. But there's on the flip side, networking is also important and building relationships with folks in the industry. What are your three top tips for contacting and building relationships with recruiters and other professionals in tech? Yeah, great question. Um, the first is don't be shy, you know, like be, be yourself, be unique, but be concise and nice because ultimately you're asking someone's time. Um, the second would probably be come with a specific goal or topic or questions that you're looking to answer because again, you're asking someone of their time. So what are you looking to get out of this? Is it growth? Is it a specific role? Um, and then the, the third thing, which is a little bit of a fun one, share interesting articles um, or meetups or something that you have found. I'm always looking to learn the, the person that you're looking for, you know, um, to learn from is, is human and is growing as well. So if you are entry level and trying to kind of get a foot in the door, you probably have more time to find out cool new things and new meetups and ideas. So share those, that's, you know, an awesome way to just transfer information. I love that. I, I, oh, sorry. What were you saying, Hillary? I was just going to say, those are my three. <laughs> also, I love, I love SoundCloud, by the way. I just had to say that. Um, but, but yeah, for, for two or three, yeah, be specific. Like if you are trying to ask about a specific role, I would maybe ask someone that's not on the recruiting team, just because again, the volume is really high. And I tell people, like, if you reach out and you don't hear back from a recruiter or someone from talent, it's never personal. They probably just have a lot of messages and they're just trying to get through all of them. Um, but I would suggest being a recruiter if you're like, I just applied for this role. I really just want to flag my resume so that you see it and like kind of leave it at that and, and say what role it is, of course. If you want to get time to understand more about the position, how it fits with the org, uh, you know, what it's like being on the tech team, I would look to see who's their front end engineer, who's their back end engineers, because they usually have a bit more time to chat and will be open to doing that because they're having less conversations throughout the day with people. So I would definitely suggest that. Like when I was looking for jobs, I would find someone who had that job and ask them about like, I would say like any 15 minutes to talk through like, what will make me stand out? What's in my resume? What are they looking for? Like be really prescriptive in your ask. Um, but I think like those two things would like definitely make you stand out above like the rest because most outreach that I get is like very blanket like, hey, can you help me find roles at your company? That would be great for me. And I'm like, I will help you, but my feedback is to be specific in like what you're asking. Yeah, I'll sort of offer just a, from the other side as a one person people department um, for a, a growing, very famous, becoming very famous in the news company. Um, and as someone whose information has been sold on Zoom info, um, the number, the amount of spam that feels like spam that I get um, can make me feel bad at how much I want to respond to every candidate. But it's hard to sort through the number of recruiters who are trying to get me to use them as a recruiter. So I try to catch the candidates. I really, honestly, I do because I want to, um, I come I'm from a place of deep empathy of knowing how you feel like trying to break your way into a really tough market. Um, so like, don't do triple following up, but do a following up. <laughs> um, and, and if you can understand the, the pile that we're sorting through to get to what to get to you, um, and that we want to, and that recruit, I never roll my eyes at a candidate. I roll my eyes at recruiters, uh, external contract recruiters, but I never roll my eyes at candidates. I, I, I admire your persistence. I admire you. Um, you'll probably have better luck doing a little triangulation, exactly like Alexis said. Look for look for a person who has the job you want, and talk to them. It's it's lower stakes, right? Because um, you only get sort of one shot to talk to us. Uh, but they're fine. They'll be like, yeah, I'll talk to you. 
it's really great advice uh, for, from all, all three of you and, and really being targeted and really pointed and specific on your outreach and what is it that you're trying to accomplish and really communicating that briefly. So uh, all, all of you are very busy people and the better you, the better that you can uh, say what it is that you are looking for briefly and make that very simple and make it foolproof for whoever's reading it better off you'll be I, I think so really great advice uh, from here uh, we'll love to jump dive right into our audience q a and we have a question from liana uh, liana hope you're doing well uh, her question is uh, do you have tips on how to dive into and find the right field or company that best fits you. Uh, so uh, Chindana, I'd love to start with you here first uh, in, in terms of finding that best fit. Do you have any tips? Yeah, I would say if you're in um, a, an academic environment, I would really encourage all students to try to um, gain traction with coursework on any of those related fields or industries. Um, I know there's like a certain minimum you have to hit with specific credits for specific classes, but if you're able to take electives on um, any of those fields that you're interested in, intro to coding, whatever it is, I, I would highly encourage that. If you're not in an academic environment and you're already working, I really strongly believe in informational interviews. Um, as much as you can, be really relentless about just approaching a company or the head of a department on LinkedIn and you know, make it really clear to them that while there isn't even a job opening on the website, you just want to learn. You're just there to get information. Um, and, you know, most times people will be willing to help you, um, especially if you're new to a field. Um, so whether they're just sending you information or, you know, they're, they're sending you reading material or they're able to actually get on a call with you, um, try to learn as much as you can from the actual people in the industry itself. Um, is my best advice to anyone. It's really great. And uh, expressing that interest, one, but then also, two, it's a wonderful way to build a relationship with that person or with that company because, sure, they might not have a job right now that's available that, that would fit you, but if they, if they know you, perhaps down the line, they'll reach out to you when they have a role. So it... it there's nothing to lose, definitely. Um, Maria's question is, is talking about once the pandemic's over, will people, will our companies looking more to bring people back into the office or is it more of work from home or a mix of the two? So uh, Sarah, I'd love to go to you here first. Yes. I mean, obviously, if I could answer this question with accuracy, I would be a very rich woman. Um, all of the industries, the real estate industry, the restaurant industry, everyone would want to know uh, the answer. I can tell you about us. I can tell you about us, uh, you know, a startup in New York um, who was previously about 25% distributed, 75% co-located in New York, and now we're obviously 100% distributed. Um, we deeply desire to be together. We really want to be together. And when we made the decision to go, um, you know, uh, obviously it was like a immediate work from home on March 6th or whatever that day was. Um, and then all of the decisions that happened both in the short term and um, in the making decisions about the long term, like changing offices, et cetera. Those were all really um, hard decisions when we desperately wanted to be together. Um, but we had it, we took the needs of our staff into account and they needed to make life choices. They needed to get apartments. They needed to figure out where they were going to be. Um, and so I think that when we made the decision to invite people into our community who don't, who won't be co-located in New York, that's a commitment we made to those people. Um, I think in the end, we have sh shifted our strategy and you will see that reflected in, a, in an ongoing way. That being said, our CEO has a strong preference, like he's a whiteboard guy, if I may use the, uh, the phrase, he needs to do collaboration in person. Um, and so um, unfortunately for folks not in New York, in a year and a half when we're all feeling different, 
um, certain seat more senior positions are people are going to have more luck if they're located here. But I think for folks like you who are early in your career and are going to do development or data science or data engineering and uh, software engineering, etc. Um, I think you'll have an advantage in the long run to be located where you want to be located. Um, I would encourage being flexible on your start time, like flexible on your day. Um, and you might be able to advocate for yourself in a way, maybe a group that's trying to not do a remote thing. You'd say, well, I'm willing to operate on your time zone or whatever that thing might be. Um, but I, I expect that there will be a return to offices, um, but that it will not be mandatory. Uh, it'll be a long time from now. I think we're looking at 18 months before we're like people are like, riding the subway, like going to work. Um, and, and I think even then our focus will be on people live where they live. How can we bring folks together um, on a regular basis all at once and then send them back home versus paying to house people in a New York City office space, which as you can imagine is quite expensive. Um, and to answer somebody's question earlier about are we giving more or less benefits and things uh, we've gone really far out of our way to say, you are in your home, we would have you in our office. Um, what can we do? How far, how generous can we be in making sure that you have the benefits and the setup? And we do a one-time $1,200 home office setup stipend. That number we came to through hard work of figuring out like, how can we be as generous and reasonable as possible at the same time? Now we're paying for part of our employees' internet uh, connection. We're trying to offer new different benefits, uh, but I, I do think that the, the future is hybrid. Definitely. It, it appears that way for sure. When you look, go into an office and you see empty desk, but then you have everyone longing to, to be together. So we are going to find some type of balance either way, no matter what happens. So really, really great insight. Um, Hillary, we'll love to go to you next on uh, Danielle's question. So it's a two-parter about best way to get noticed as a designer and um, how to really stand out as someone who is not a young designer. So uh, Danielle is uh, one of our uh, bootcamp grads in the accelerator. How can she really prove her value and worth to folks who value more of a youthful perspective? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, we look at portfolios uh, online and if your website is stellar, then that's gonna what that's what is going to make you get noticed the most. Um, we have a volume of portfolios and resumes to get through, so we actually just extract all the portfolios for our creative designer or design team to kind of peruse through, and they'll sort of like pick and choose. And in that case, to jump to the second part of the question it's sort of a blind resume review or a blind portfolio review. We don't know the age or the sex or ethnicity of the individual that we're looking at unless they put a bio on there, in which case you don't have to, um, but it gives you an opportunity to just kind of evaluate the work as it is um, and your style guide and the way that you present your work, the projects that you're working on are one thing and then the way that you present your work is another thing and that I think having those two opportunities to really showcase that gives you as a designer an opportunity to actually double up on your opportunity to work in an organization. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely an opportunity to get in front of the right people uh, as long as you have a clean and clear sort of style and then look for companies that have sort of a similar style or, you know, what you find to be creative. Um, think about, you know, going to a museum and getting sort of inspired there and then, you know, write a blog post about it. Like uh, kind of think beyond the box. Thinking be uh, beyond the box and just outside of the box is, is definitely a great way to go for no matter what role you're approaching. So really, really great advice there, Hillary. Um, Alexis, we'll love to go to you next on, on um, Mahir's question about types of projects or project-based work that you consider when looking at applicants. Uh, is it more team-oriented or solo work? What, what's more valuable to you? I was actually going to say a good mix of both <laughs> because 
I love to see people that do like side projects that are personally exciting to them. Like I, I was interviewing someone that created an app that helped track early signs of like melanoma um, or diabetes because someone in their family had it. And he, and he was constantly trying to grow himself and the skills that he didn't have, whether it was like react native or angular, just to get savvy with that. But it's also really important to get projects with teams too, to understand like, how is it like working with product managers? How is it working with quality engineers? How is it balancing the needs of design and engineering? Like, I think as well-rounded as you can get is the best way to go. So yeah, I know it's kind of like a cop out, but I think a good mix of both will definitely help you in the long run. Definitely. And if you have one or the other, identifying and really seeking out the experiences that can help balance you out is often the best way to go there. So really great insights, uh, Alexis. And uh, uh, Chinzana, Sarah, I know that you were both interested in Austin's question here. So um, Austin's interested, is thinking about applying for a large company, doesn't know what job he wants, but how, uh, how do you make the transition from one role to another within a company? Uh, if you're looking, comparing apples and apples, uh, how do you really make that judgment to go between one to another? Uh, what, what advice or feedback do you have on that? Yeah, that, that's a good one because it's, it's not a bad strategy to get your foot in the door at an organization first and then move around. Um, it's actually what a lot of large companies want. They, they want to present you with a lot of roles to choose from because they want to keep you for as long as they can. So they'll be assessing you as, as a general athlete during, in, during the interview process. There are some things to consider with that, though. Um, one of the first things is that a lot of companies have different policies on how long you can actually or how long you have to be in a role for before you can transfer to another role. Um, for some companies, there, there is no limit. For others, there's about a year. Um, for some companies, it's a couple years. So just keep in mind that when you come into this given organization, you might be in a role that you don't love for a couple years, which just could totally backfire. Um, if you do want to go that route, um, you need to remember that you're not just going to get into this company and then make a transition. You have to be able to overperform. You have to be a top performer in that role to make a lateral move. Um, in a large organization, there's also a lot of competition and a lot of people are going to be gunning for the same role that you are, even though it's still internally. Um, so, you know, the best thing I could say about that is that don't don't take it for granted that you're already in the door now and you can, you can move to whatever you want. You have to be a top performer to get sign off from your manager. Any other team that looks at you internally is going to want to see your numbers, your, you know, whatever it is before they sign off on that. Um, and then the last thing I could say for how you go about it is um, don't be intimidated by the size of a company that you're in, especially if it's a big one. It can, it can feel kind of weird. And there are a lot of formalities that come with just like, putting time on someone's calendar to chat with them. Um, but that's really the way that you should um, network internally. You know, meet with different managers from different teams. Um, try to sit, on, sit in on different team meetings um, to gain perspective and start you know, building relationships that way. Um, the other thing I would say is as much as you can, always try to keep your own manager in the loop. Um, let them know that, that you love this role and that you're really grateful for you know, the experience that you got, but that it's not necessarily end game for you. You're really interested in whatever else it is so that you know, they might see meetings on your calendar of you talking to this other, this other team or whatever it is. I think the more you can keep your own manager in the loop and more, the more respectful you can be about that, um, the easier that transition will be for you. Yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you just said. Um, and a little bit of a, a adjacent perspective. Um, I think this is a great way to get to the role that you want. And it's also a great way to probably figure out that might not have been the role you wanted anyway. Um, but getting started at an organization, especially if you're early in your career, even if it's earlier in this career, like you might be a career changer. I'm not referring to age. I'm talking about stage of career with this particular field that you're looking in. Um, get in the door and make friends. Um, it is the opposite of a reality game show. I am here to make friends. Um, 
so this is this is your opportunity to um, to look for also collaboration opportunities. Um, you know whether the, whether it's just you're having lunch with someone, you hear a thing they're working on. Oh, that's really cool! Like I worked on something like this in college. Can I show you my work on that? Um, anything that is very very well, like innocently. I don't innocent isn't the right word, but like have a good time, make those connections because they're valuable and good. And then if you do that with the best of intentions of just building your network, that's what will pay off. If people you know, start to interpret you as a climber and that you're always trying to get someone's time because you're trying to get seen, um, then some people might be less eager to work with you. But if you come across as someone who always wants to help, who always wants to make friends, who always wants to see, well, what are you working on? This is what I'm working on. Those are the people that make a name for themselves. Um, I personally, love talking to people about their jobs. And there are people like that at every company, not just in people departments, in every department. Some people are, are little baby cultural anthropologists. They wanna know what you're working on. Here's what I'm working on. Um, and so find those people, have a good time, be enthusiastic um, and think about the future as open-ended and that you might act, you might stumble upon a really exciting opportunity. Someone sees you as a cool, collaborative, open, warm, friendly person. Man, I want that in my group. And then opportunities will start to come to you. And you'll have to do a lot less work in hunting down the opportunities because you'll be that person they want to reach out to. Sure. It's all about relationships and also making sure that uh you you give as much as you're receiving, right? You want to make sure that 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 equation holds up and it's equal. And if you feel that it's a little bit out of balance, then you have to try to make it work a little bit more to, to be more equitable for sure. Uh, we'll finish up, uh, Hillary. We'll finish up with uh, Alexander's question. And since he uh, has more of an international student background, he's asking, uh, what is the general attitude towards hiring international talent uh, considering the current situation? Uh, is it um, the same? Did you have to change policies? What's in, in terms of what's going on in SoundCloud and uh, just in general, what's your feeling towards that? Yeah, so it is tricky uh, because the, um, how do I say this, nonpartisan, because of the recent, whatever, because of the new rules, the um, visa process has become a lot more complicated. So we actually had to update our policy in that we have various levels at SoundCloud. So we have one through seven, one being entry level, seven being our C-level. Um, so we actually had to implement a rule that level four, which is director and above, are the only ones that were able to actually support visas. Um, and there's actually been new, new regulations around new visas. So we've, we've actually lost a couple individuals who've had to return to their home countries because of that. Um, fun fact, SoundCloud is actually globally headquartered in Berlin. It's where all of our product engineering and design teams sit. So we are actually looking at international talent for our Berlin office. Now, the flip side of that is Berlin isn't letting anybody in um, from anywhere else. So we have a ton of individuals who are freelancing across Europe, who are based in the US and working out of our US offices before they can get their visa appointments to actually get to Berlin. So we found areas to make it work. Um, it's not perfect, it's not long-term, and hopefully you'll all vote on November 3rd and we'll make some changes happen. Yeah, it, 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 it's all about one, you know, waiting it out, but then two, you know, taking action when time comes. So I, I think that's a wonderful place to, to uh, Sarah, I think you have one comment here oh, as well. I just, I just wanted to say, Alexander, you're not alone. Um, I employ uh, some of the world's leading experts in things who are struggling with visa stuff. Um, I employ incredible world-class talent who are stuck in places. Um, this is, people are dealing with this all over the world. And I think this is what Hillary said, but like, hang in there, um, get the support that you need, knowing that this is something that a lot of people are going through. For sure. And, you know, another point for building relationships, right? Even if they can't help you directly now, it's good to have a conversation. So uh, I think we're going to leave it at that for this evening, but this has been a really incredible conversation. Uh, just having all of you here with us and sharing your insights. We covered a lot of ground in an hour. I, just, I can't believe it's been an hour already. So <laughs> 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And for those of you watching, we're gonna be sending you the recording if you registered uh, for the students in the Career Accelerator. We're gonna follow up with you directly with a couple next steps. And ladies on our panel, again, bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Really do appreciate it, uh, taking the time, sharing the insights and, and for having a lot of fun with us for the, for the past hour. So um, we have we host one of these uh, every six weeks. So if you're interested in learning more about tech and meeting really cool people like our, the folks on our panel today, uh, www.linerun.co backslash events. Like I said, every six weeks, next one's in December. So hope to see you then. So until then, uh, have a good one, everybody.